Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Betsy Peck Learned, Dean of University Libraries here at Roger Williams. And I'd like to welcome you all to our inaugural um, campus poetry walk um, in celebration of National Poetry Month, which is April. The theme for the poetry walk is celebrating the spaces we live in. So what is a poetry walk? Throughout the center of campus, starting at the Rogers statue, 18 student staff poems are currently featured on laminated posters in a walking, short walking trail through the buildings and around. Um, additionally, the poems are memorialized and archived as a permanent digital exhibition in the library's digital repository, thanks to Mary Wu, our um, digital scholarship librarian. Um, this afternoon's event features our esteemed guest speaker, former poet, poet laureate Robert Pinsky, whom we had the pleasure to host virtually in 2020 on Zoom as part of our Talking in the Library series. And I know some of you were there because we mentioned it. Uh, Professor Adam Braver, the library's program director, will be introducing Mr. Pinsky in a moment. The reading will be followed by a reception for all of you, including the featured poets and our speaker. You will also have the opportunity to purchase copies of um, several of Mr. Pinsky's books where Cindy is sitting in the back or the front. Back, I guess. <laughs> the Campus Poetry Walk was a true collaboration between a group of staff from the University Library and the Tutoring and Writing Centers. Post-pandemic, four of us got together and decided we really needed to do something fun. <laughs> we formed a committee and put out a call to the university community for poems. We were especially fortunate to connect with RWU, R RWU I always have trouble saying that, alumnus Jesse Ramos, who was willing to teach two poetry writing workshops for our students during this past academic year. Graphic design student Tori Chiklis who has been working in the tutoring center, created the design for the posters and the signs. And the digital exhibition where the poems are archived was created by Mary Wu, who manages the library's digital repository. We thank everyone for being so generous with their time and especially the poets, whose poems are simply awesome. <laughs> We'd also like to thank the sponsors of the program who enabled us to fund the production of the signs and this event, including the provost office, the Center for Student Academic Success, and the University Library's Mary Tuff White Endowment. And now I'd like to invite Adam Braver to introduce our speaker, Robert Pinsky. Thank you. Right. When we first invited Robert Pinsky to speak today, the thought and a reasonable one, I think, was that his participation in celebrating the inaugural poetry walk was to some degree part of his part of the lineage of his tenure as U.S. Poet Laureate. During his time in that role, Robert made it his mission to raise and expand the awareness of poetry beyond its most canonical realms, with perhaps his most lasting message being the idea that poetry is among us all, is among us in all aspects of our lives not in the sense of forms and enjambments and assonance, et cetera, but in the idea that our natural environment, which includes us humans as part of it, is a kind of poetry, one that surrounds us, informs us, awakens us, heals us, and once seen and appreciated, reflects the beauty, artfulness, and grace of this world, as difficult as it may be to see at times. But on the most practical level, as poet laureate, Robert worked so hard to remind people that anyone can be a lowercase p poet, that one does not have to be dedicated to the study of poetics in order to be an active participant in engaging with the everyday poetry of the world. That was the thought when we first invited Robert Pinsky. <laughs> but since that time, after reading Robert's new book, Jersey Breaks, it also seems to me a bit of fortuitous timing. A memoir told in a series of personal essays, Jersey Breaks chronicles Robert's upbringing in Long Branch, New Jersey, asking an implicit question, how does the environment in which you've been raised make you the person who you've become? In Jersey Breaks, we see this question worked out through Robert's family, his teachers, colleagues, and friends, 
the physical spaces of his homes, and even, particularly fascinating to me, through the consideration of the actual names of the people who he grew up around. And being who he is, Robert goes beyond the inquiry of how this descendant of a notorious Long Branch rogue could have ended up being a poet, but even more specifically, how he became the type of poet who he is, musical, risk-taking, stubborn, mournful, playful, challenging, accessible, just to name a few. <laughs> I bring this up because at heart, because at its heart, at least for this reader, Jersey Breaks is about the relationship to place and how we find meaning within where we found ourselves. Something that of course is behind the theme of the poetry walk, celebrating the spaces we live in. Like Robert's book, his mission, and of course his deeply affecting body of work, through this campus poetry walk, not only are we able to honor the public display of poetry as a way to engage with our world, but we're also able to think about what the spaces mean to us and, and most importantly to the collective us, our community whose borders one hopes through the everyday poetry of the world will keep expanding and expanding and expanding and welcoming in more and more people. In short, I can't think of a better person to celebrate this space with us. Please welcome Robert Pinsky. Thank you so much, Adam Graver, for that uh, very kind introduction. And thank you, Betsy Lerner, for your work and for taking me on the poetry walk. Uh, it was inspiring. And as Adam implied, uh, my notion of poetry is very combined uh, with the notion of respecting the individual uh, people one at a time. Uh, I sometimes think the need for poetry and the, to some people, surprising appetite for and popularity of poetry has a lot to do with the wonderful mass media that we have. Every one of us has in our pocket or in our purse so much music and video and jokes. And it, that is great beyond a question. And our big, huge TV screens that are as good as movies. And all these things I love and use, and they are on a mass scale by the nature of the medium. That is not to say it's bad. Many great things are on a mass scale. I know there's such a thing as a great sitcom. Probably even a few commercials are great. And uh, believe me, I know that some poems are stupid. Possible to have a poem to be really boring and dumb. It all depends. But the poem, by the nature of the medium, is on a human scale and respects the dignity of the individual. So when Betsy and I, and was it Linda? Susan. Susan. Betsy and Susan and I took a walk there to see the poems. Walking like speaking, everybody does it their own way. It was slightly chilly. My hosts were worried that I have enough to keep me warm. It was on a human scale. And when we say media, the mass medium, media is the plural refers to the medium of digital devices, the medium of film. An artist has the medium of oil or water cover. Um, the medium for poem, I believe, is one person's voice. Not necessarily the, not necessarily the voice of the artist who makes it. It's the voice of anyone who says it. We were talking before I came up here about the videos at favoritepoem.org. 
And yes, there's an Emily Dickinson poem. It's not read by an actor. Emily Dickinson is long dead. It's not read by Emily Dickinson. It's not read by a professor of poetry. It's read by a kind of a 12 or 13 year old American kid who was born in China. She says, I'm expected to be a perfect Chinese daughter, a perfect American kid. I have to work hard in school. I work on my musical instruments. And then she reads twice and talks about Emily Dickinson's poem, I'm Nobody, Who Are You? So what I hope to be able to present to you is a notion of this art of poetry as having particular greatness based on the small scale of its medium. Now, medium comes in between. Something either good nor bad or hot nor cold, it's medium. And what comes between Emily Dickinson and that kid in the video, it's the kid's voice is the medium for Emily Dickinson, the artist long gone. The normal procedure for an occasion like this one is somebody talks for 40 minutes, God forbid, even more. <laughs> and then there's uh, questions and remarks from the audience. Uh, I have an impulse that I've sometimes felt before to maybe not do it that way. Maybe I will pause from time to time and invite interruptions, questions, kind remarks, gentle remarks. <laughs> and uh, if anybody has anything they want to say before I start reading through my work, that would be fun and appropriate. Yes, ma'am. We're just glad you're here. So glad you're here. A little bit louder, please. We're so glad you're here. Thank you very much. That's the reassurance counts. <laughs> Was this your first memoir that you wrote? The question from, uh, the question is, was this my first memoir? Yes and no. In a way, every one of my poems is a memoir. Yeah. But this is the first time I ever wrote a prose book that looks like the books that people write about their life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was confiding to Adam that I resist. I know that memoir is a re retail category. It's like sportswear or uh, <laughs> small appliances. In the book business, memoir is a category of, of retail. I tend to always refer to the book as an autobiography. And I think that's because in my mind, certain ideas, what Adam said about the idea of names, and in our country, which is famously polyglot, Many different languages, many different uh, times in kinds of integration, but always combining. I think sometimes neglected is how we mix any individual is. But, uh, the categories you fill out on questionnaires about your ethnicity, uh, I think at least half of us feel, well, I'll say that. But I'm also this. <laughs> um, that idea and the way it's so often reflected in names and the kind of town I grew up in. I grew up in a resort town in a way it was the opposite of Newport. Newport was the old, now obsolete idea of the upper class, military upper class. That's where they went in the summer, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. My hometown, Long Branch, New Jersey, was very famous at its time. There's a great painting in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston where I live called Long Branch, New Jersey. He was sent there by Harper's Magazine to cover it. Long Branch is not where the elite, the old elite went. That was Newport. Or maybe Saratoga Springs, New York. Long Branch was where show business people, you know, patent medicine millionaires, Sports people. Long Branch, New Jersey is where the modern idea 
that replaced the upper class, it's the modern idea of celebrity was born. Celebrity is invented in Long Branch. Famous gambler, Diamond Jim Brady, went there with his girlfriend, uh, uh, Diamond Lil. Diamond Lil Russell. And the first electric cars, he had a fleet of them. It was lit up inside these two overdressed big people riding up and down the boardwalk. Uh, President Grant loved Long Branch, fast horses, women, the boardwalk. It was all kind of vulgar and showy, and it's what we have now to replace the upper classes. And in my town, people were very conscious of your ethnicity and your name. So that if your name was uh, Johnson or Robinson, to me, that meant either you're a black person or you're a Protestant. And in my neighborhood, Protestants were a minority. Much more likely to be an Italian or Irish Catholic or Jewish. Or in the strange neighborhood I described in my book, I lived, uh, I lived on Rockwell Avenue. Went back to Long Branch High School after I got to be a big deal to people. The one thing that most impressed the students was that I grew up on Rockwell Avenue. Because Rockwell Avenue, I lived actually right across the street from the junction with Monmouth Avenue. Monmouth Avenue was all black. Rockwell Avenue was multifamily houses and rooming houses, mostly Italian some Jewish and Irish. And at my end of Monmouth was Dr. Julius McKelvey, the black doctor in the town. I remember seeing him in his three-piece suit. And that was sort of like one end of Monmouth, and the other end of Monmouth Avenue was the Tally Ho Tavern that I tell about in the book. And that's where I saw the poster for the dancer Little Egypt. Little did I know that for a century, dancers called Little Egypt, of various colors and ethnicities and kinds of dancing, had appeared at different stages. So eventually, it was covered by Elvis Presley, started with the coasters, Little Egypt. So in that autobiography, I try to reflect on things like the 100-year history of Little Egypt. The fact that Dr. McKelvey, I learned decades after I lived there, he'd been active in the early years of the NAACP, tried unsuccessfully, among other things, to integrate, to integrate the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> the beaches in my hometown, Long Branch, there are many beaches now, just about 15 or 20 beaches. One, you're allowed to go into that skin that had any African relation. God forbid the, uh, the white people might get into the same Atlantic Ocean beach. That's the black people. Both absurd and tragic. And uh, I try to remember my own relation to history. And that's why I prefer the term autobiography. It's my first autobiography. Uh, I had the honor of a bookstore in, uh, in Boston, the great sociologist Orlando Patterson. Orlando was sort of in conversation with me about the book. And he pointed out that that neighborhood that I lived in, as I say in the book, it was, you could call it a Two segregated neighborhoods. There were two white families on Monmouth Avenue. Uh, my friend, his dad, my friends, Marty and Irwin, their dad was a Jewish junk dealer, and he had a house on Monmouth Avenue with all black neighbors. And Orlando pointed out that that, that late 50s, that was a very rare time, a window before redlining really got going before the real estate industry discovered how powerful redlining could be. I'll read a poem or two to you, having talked quite a lot in a general way 
And uh, then I may just, uh, I may just stubbornly just say, I'm not going to quote anymore until the person asks the question. Oh, I'll have a long, embarrassing silence. <laughs> just warning you now. This is the poem I chose to put first in my selected poems. It's called Rhyme. Rhyme. Air, an instrument of the tongue. The tongue, an instrument of the body. The body, an instrument of spirit. Spirit, a being of the air. A bird, the medium. Each bird, the medium of its song. Each song, a world, a containment, like a hotel room, ready for us guests who inherit our compartment of time there. In the Joseph Cornell box, among ephemera as its element, the preserved bird, a study in spontaneous elegy, the stuffed parrot art, mortal in its cornered sphere. Each room a stanza, rocking in a laddered filament, hammered by all us unsteady chambered voices that share it, each one reciting, I too was here. I too was here. In a room, a rhyme, a song, in the box, in books, each element and instrument, the body still straining the parrot, the spirit, a being of the air. Somebody said in a rather kind review of my book, it's so like Robert Pinsky to write a poem called Rhyme that doesn't rhyme. <laughs> it does. It doesn't rhyme like the time you had a chime and ate a line. But it's tongue, instrument, body, spirit, song, containment, ready, inherited, among elements, study, parrot, rum, film, well, who cares? But it does rhyme. I'll read one or two more poems to you, and then there will be questions and remarks from the audience. Or else. Samurai song. Samurai song. When I had no roof, I made audacity my roof. When I had no supper, my eyes dined. When I had no eyes, I listened. When I had no ears, I thought. When I had no thought, I waited. When I had no father, I made care my father. When I had no mother, I embraced order. When I had no friend, I made quiet my friend. When I had no enemy, I opposed my body. When I had no temple, I make my voice my temple. I have no priest. My tongue is my choir. When I have no fortune, Fortune is my means. When I have no means, death will be my fortune. Need is my tactic. Detachment is my strategy. When I had no lover, I courted my sleep. Adam told me, and he said to you just now, that uh, a theme for me is in relation to place, the way that a place, I've already talked to you a lot about my hometown of Warmbrand, the way that a place can form a person and we reflect on it. I'm going to read a poem to you that sort of makes fun of that idea. Kind of a parody of poems and writing about places. It falls into stereotypes and cliches so easily. So that finally, 
one person's memoir about all the Polish miners in my part of Pennsylvania and somebody else's about all oh, the Cape Verdean fishermen in my part of Massachusetts. And somebody else, oh yes, the Dominican neurologist that I used to know and blah, blah, blah. And it all sounds the same. It becomes part of a pattern. And that's why in the course of this poem, there's a moment in this poem where I become sort of Chinese. And I mention my Irish grandmother. And you don't know me, so maybe I do have. And the poem is called Window. The idea is that everybody has a window of time, place. I have a window of having born in the middle of the 20th century to two Jewish people in the English-speaking post-World War II United States of America. That's my window. And we can add, I'm heterosexual. Getting quite old. That's my space. That's my window. But I'm allowed, I propose to you, to try to look out of my window. I can never get out of a window, but I can try to look. So if I have a dear friend who's a gay Chinese American woman with a Puerto Rican grandmother, and I read her poems carefully and we're very important to one another, am I not at least a little bit a gay Chinese woman? If not, what is all this writing for? If you can a little bit, at least a little bit, be something besides that definition, that factual rectangle. So this is partly a genuine memoir and partly uh, laughing at the idea of memoir. Window. Our building floated heavily through the cold on shifts of steam that the raging coal-fed furnace forced from the boiler's hull. In showers of spark, the trolleys flashed careening under our cornice. My mother, Mary Beamish, who came from Cork, held me up to see the snow fall out the window. Windhold, she called it. Sometimes, as if in Irish, it held wind out or showed us that wind was old. Windhold in Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxon, Faces like brick, they worshipped Easter's rabbit. And mistletoe, that was Thor's jism, where thunder struck the oak. We took their language in our mouth and chewed. Some of the consonants drove us nearly crazy, because we were Chinese. Or was that just the food my father brought from our restaurant downstairs, in the fells, by the falls? The old ghetto, or New Jersey, little Havana, or little Russia. I forget, because the baby wasn't me, the way these words are not me. However, she was teaching to talk. Snow, she said, snow. And you opened your small brown fist and closed it and opened again to hold the reflection of torches and faces inside the window glass and through it, a cold black sheen of shapes and fires shaking, kitchen lights, flakes that crisped and crossed other lights in lush diagonals, the snow-charmed traffic surging and pausing, red, green, white, the motion of moats and torches that at her word, you reach out for where you were. It was you, that bright confusion. Because I think everybody is a bright confusion. Yeah. The human being is a bright confusion. And now, as promised, there will be questions <laughs> for long, embarrassing silence. <laughs> have a statement. I, I, I'm so in awe of your 
readings and the voice that I am just enjoying it. And I really um, feel that that's what poetry is all about, and that's what it should be. And yeah, I'm listening to you, but of course I have you know a little more uh, training than some of the people here, but I'm just really impressed. Thank you very much. She said this, I won't quite summarize it, but what Vincent said, he said very nice things about what he's done so far. And she implied that, uh, oh, you're you're so impressive, but you're sloppy desk to say things. <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah. I haven't had the opportunity to be around people who uh, are at your level uh, often. And I, Really appreciate it when I can. It's like I'm transported. It's really yeah. a wonderful thing. I appreciate you saying kind things. Uh, I'm also embarrassed. <laughs> Everybody in the world has imposter oh, I, syndrome. I <laughs> Everybody feels I don't deserve this to have it inevitably, and I'll confide in you all. This made any easier that I see Robert right there. <laughs> Every time I look up, I see somebody who looks exactly like me, except he's got white hair. <laughs> Yes. I'm wondering, um, you know, as an as an artist, as a writer, um, I think you know the freedom of expression is so important. And I wonder if it's harder to be a poet or a writer or an artist today when there are maybe external constraints on what you can say um, or express, you know, cancel culture and what is okay to say and what is not okay to say and that that kind of impulse in society. I think you heard the question. It says do things like incorrect speech, cancel culture, does it inhibit me? And is it a problem for me? Uh, there used to be a theory, I haven't heard it very much lately, used to be a theory that why there are so many wonderful poets that came out of uh, the first early 20th century in Russia is that the regime was so punitive. Poets like Mandelstam, Ahmadov, they and their families were put into prison. Their works were censored. I remember meeting Polish poets who said there's a tradition of writing for the desk bar. Not right for publication. The great short story writer, the Russian short story writer Isaac Babel, was first silenced and then basically tortured to death. My problems are yours, are so mild compared to the history of problems that people have been known to have. And though one is I'm inclined to not want to hear that theory. I remember when I used to hear it a lot, it used to bother me. There's enough in it to suggest that, oh, are you afraid of somebody who's going to criticize you for this or that? I don't want to stoke your fire. Figure out a way to deal with it that is not predictable. Figure out a way, whatever you are oppressed by internally, and there are many problems inside Robert, believe me. Then there are other problems outside Robert. Pedal part sometimes. That's your job. If you don't look like your work is on the table, you have to say, oh, I don't have any work. I don't have anything to write about it. Keep going. So, uh, as I said to Betsy Squid, yes and no. It's a serious question you ask. Um, there's a case getting a lot of attention in the Boston area. Have you read about this guy in East Hampton? His name is Vito Perone, and a lot of the interest in uh, names. I went to school with a lot of people, little, this guy's probably about 50, I'm guessing, print his pictures in the paper, but I went to school with a lot of people. Most of the people I went to school with were named Vito Perone. <laughs> So to speak. And this guy, he's the acting superintendent in West Springfield. He was a principal in East Hampton. He's been a teacher, he's been an administrator. 
he was in the final stages of getting a job as superintendent of schools in this little town of East Hampton. And he wrote an email, his final negotiations with the person who was, I think she's the chairman of the school board and her assistant. And he said to them, dear ladies, I would like to have in my vacation time to find differently. I would like my salary to be adjusted like this. And the chairman of the school board, the assistant later dissociated from this. She said, I don't feel the way she does. Chairman of the school board said, you addressed us as ladies. That is a microaggression. And for uh, an educator not to be aware that the word ladies is a microaggression disqualifies you for this job. I don't pretend to know what the justice uh, yeah. Anyway, there have now been a, hundreds of students and teachers demonstrated on his behalf. Other people said, ah, he was, of course, there's no unanimity about it. So the school board met and they offered the job to another one of the three candidates. Understandably, she turned it down and said, <laughs> other things I want to do. <laughs> This is our times, and I choose to talk to you about it because I respect the question and because I look on it as my job. My job as a teacher, my job as a poet is to think about it. And I think there are deep times when calling somebody a lady is condescending and insulting. And I think indeed there are arguments to be made like this guy was born 50 something years ago. Ladies and gentlemen were he was, he was trying to adapt the manners of his parents or grandparents' generation. This woman was rather aggressively applying the, the manners of her children's generation or his grandchildren, I don't know. And you know, I've heard people say, so does that mean Jill Biden was the first woman? And if he had said, dear gentlemen, we're been wrong, etc. This is not to be simply played from. It's to be engaged, to be thought about. I look at it as, thank God I have things to think about. I live in, I don't have the curse of times as interesting as the times of Anna Akhmadova or Pablo Neruda, a real, not just the rise of fascism, we're dealing with in our country, but a serious fascist government. I've never had to deal with that. So uh, to be excessively complaining or mournful would be disproportionate. Mm -hmm. See, I told you if you ask a question, I will watch yak. <laughs> Any other questions before I resume? question, and that is the relationship of writing and prose poetry. Um, and I'm thinking particularly in the personal essay, right? Now, there's a lot of thought that the personal essay and the poem are much closer than the personal essay. Yeah. And, and, and Everybody's different. And I think every writer is different in relation to prose and poetry, personal essay, and uh, writing a poem. My writing poetry rose out of starting off wanting to be a musician. In my high school graduating class, I was not voted most literary boy, definitely not most likely to succeed. I was voted most musical boy. Played the horn at dances. I wasn't on the football team, I was playing. And when I pick up this book, every sentence I look at, I start rewriting. Mm -hmm. Prose never feels right to me, never feels finished. I always thought it could be better if it was this way or that way. If I pick up a book of my poems, I may look at something and think I wouldn't do it that way again, or I'd like to try that again in a different way. 
but it's like something that has been sandpapered or painted. I have made it as good as I can make it. Doubtless God can make it better. Rob can. I, I'm finished with that. And uh, everybody's different. That's the way I feel. And it's like uh, singing or playing an instrument. There will be other performances, but you sang it. You played it. Uh, and I'm not presenting that as a general principle, but as my personal experience. I probably tortured you bad enough, so I'll read a couple of poems to do with names. This is a uh, this is manuscript of my book that will be published next winter. The most has been published in magazines. This will be probably the longest I'm reading to you. It was a newspaper article, be considered very short. It's probably about a thousand words. Uh, and uh, to, uh, to most of you, the title won't mean much. It's Explained in the poem. The title is Branca, B R A N C A. Two oldsters in the room may immediately think about Branca. Ralph Branca was the 15th of 17 children. This poem is not the poem of quote, the speaker. End quote. His father was an immigrant from Calabria. These words are those of Robert Pinsky, speaking. Ronka wore Dodger uniform number 13. Speaking is the punchline of a Jewish joke. Some Romans call Calabrians Africani. Brooklyn had its own daily, the Brooklyn Eagle. At 85, Ralph Bronco learned about his mother. He was 21 when Jackie Robinson joined the Dodgers. At 11, I loved Robinson for his daring, running the bases, stealing home, his fire. Bronco was one of the few who befriended him. I was too young to understand his mission the fuel of that dancing to talk the pitcher. Robinson never forgot Bronca's kindness. What the old man found out about his mother is she was born a Jew in Hungary, Tucky. After he gave up the most famous home run ever, back in the clubhouse, Bronca lay weeping, face down, Tati gave birth to 17 Catholic children. The Giants won the pennant, 1951. Bronco means claw, a fit name for a pitcher. His teammates thought it best that he cry alone. But, quote, only my dear friend Jackie, who knew me so well, came over and put his arm around my shoulder." Quote. The Nazis killed the aunts and uncles Bronca didn't know existed until he was old. Quote two, in itself a nothing of a number. The Dodgers traded Bronca to the Tigers. Grief with its countless different ways and strains. Glory, a greater thing than success, but slower. Some of the tigers who had been giants explained to Bronca how the giants had stolen the signs from opposition catchers. The telescope in center field, wires, buzzers. Bronca chose not to talk about it. It's all in Prager's book. His research unearthed Cutty, those aunts and uncles. 
The Dodgers were taken from Brooklyn by their owner. I, Robert Pinsky, choose not to say his name. I didn't live in Brooklyn, but I knew the score. I knew it was a kind of underdog place. Nowadays, once a year, all major leaguers wear Jackie Robinson's number, 42. <clears throat> in the joke, the person who answers the telephone at Goldberg, Goldberg, and Goldberg keeps replying that Goldberg is out of the office, and so is Goldberg. All right, then let me talk to Goldberg. <laughs> Speaking. Robinson spoke to Bronco. Without you, he said, we never could have made it this far. I put a special pressure and embarrassment on the students. Anybody here under 25, what the hell's the matter with you? Do you like to read? Do I like to read? Yeah. Less than I did when I was very young. I tend to reread more and more as I get older. I think when I was young, there was a kind of immersion. Reading was like becoming another person, entering another world. When I was 12 years old, reading Alice in Wonderland, or kidnapped your treasure island, I was dissolved into that other world. When I got more ambitious to be a writer, reading Emily Dickinson, William Butler Yeats, I was apprentice. I was trying to, how do you do that? Now I've had years of having to read things professionally, book review, things by students. And reading is less of a delicious escape for me. And therefore, I say to you, I perceive that you are possibly under 25. So I say to you, enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, I'll read more poems to you. I will fulfill my obligation. <laughs> you know, the silences were productive also. People were thinking. Um, and indeed, this is a poem with a similar length to Bronco. It is called, it will probably be the first poem in this new book or next book. It is called, indeed, Poem of Names. Poem of Names. The bad rain fell on Osamu Shimomura. On the walk home, it turned his white shirt black. Quote, my grandmother got me quickly into a bath. <clears throat> It likely saved me from death by radiation. Tugaloo's Ernst Borinsky would not discuss his family killed by Nazis. Quote, an area I have liquidated for my mental health. Quote, his grave at Tugaloo 
a kind of shrine. Salma begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, underground river of passion and retrenchment. Thank you, Elliot and Simon and Hazel, for wanting to talk to me about my dying someday. Bucky had been so cold when you touched his body. A compliment for me, that conversation. It almost doesn't matter what we said. I thought of Milford, your great grandpa. That time I asked him, did he believe in life after death? I guess that you were my life after death, he said. A boy named Christian at a Q&A in Texas asked me, the visiting poet, what motivates you? What gets you out of bed each day? Good question. The pride of Ernst Berinsky of Mississippi. The shame of Nathan Forrest of Pillow Hill. Willie Lee Rose, historian of Reconstruction. Congressman Peter, Congressman Pellegrino Rodino, called Pete. It's the dead people that motivate me, Christian. Dorothy Pinsky Wright, William Butler Yates. As to your name, I remember Don Polk saying, a lot of Jewish people think they're white, but no, they're not. In some ways, Yates was a jerk. Our Baksad begat Sala. Sala begat Aber. Oh yeah, said Ruby to Don. Well, most black people don't know that they're Goyim. Somebody said about Rodino and Sirica, the night school guys are saving the country. Boritsky needed a job, but no white school could offer him a position. Tugaloo did. At his famous forums there, he asked his students to sit one chair apart so the white kids from Millsaps sat among them. Pete Seeger, Ralph Bunch, Joan Baez at the forums. Rodino in the house impeaching Nixon. Pellegrino means pilgrim. Shimomura discovered cells that made a jellyfish glow. He garnered a million samples in Puget Sound. A protein in Iquoria Victoria embedded the glimmer in other life transformed the study of living things. Years later, the Exxon Valdez oil spill left nearly all those Iquaria dead, a poisoning that Shimomura indicted, he whose grandma had washed away the ashes. I'll read one more poem to you. Very short poem. It's called Grief. And uh, it seems appropriate to not read a poem that's not related to lying names or ethnicity. This is separate, but it's a poem about grief. I guess I'm just showing you, I don't only do one thing. You know, I'm just showing you one thing. Grief. I don't think anybody ever is really divorced, said Lenny. Also, I don't think anybody ever is really married, he said, because, because English was really Lenny's second language, and because of Yiddish and his displaced place in the world, he never really believed in his own prose. He wrote sentences the way a great boxer moves. Near the end, 
he told me, I'm in hell. Something Lenny might have said about hunting for a parking space in Berkeley. <laughs> Mike, too, was himself. His last month, too weak to paint or make prints. He sat and made drawings of flowers, ink attentive to rhythms of beach rose, wisteria, lily, forms like acrobats or Cossack dancers. Mike had a vision of his body dead on his studio floor, seen from high above. He didn't feel sad or afraid at seeing it, he said, just sorry for the person who would find it. You can't say nobody ever really dies. Of course they do. Lenny died. Mike died. But the odd thing is, the person still makes a shape distinct and present in the mind as an object in the hand. The presence in the absence. It isn't comfort. It's grief. Thank you all.